damn late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? Well, it's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But we ain't killing their army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like, say our name, bitch, say it, say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing Sheldon Richmond. He's the executive editor at the Libertarian Institute. Welcome back to the show, Sheldon. How are you doing? I'm doing fine and great to be back with you. Hope you're doing fine. I'm doing good. Um, appreciate you joining me this morning. Uh, big day today. Uh, yeah. We got we got some business to talk before we get to other things. Right. Um, first of all, our institute, the Libertarian Institute, that's you and me, libertarianinstitute.org. Uh, we've just published Will Griggs' book. It was You, Me, and Will. Uh, but then he died after about half a year of that, unfortunately, two years ago. Uh, but we finally yep. got it together um, with an incredible foreword by Tom Edlam. And an incredible, and already all the compliments are rolling in, uh, about the cover art uh, done by Will Griggs' friend Scott Albert, who did such an incredible job on this cartoon of Will uh, yes. for the front cover. And... Um, it's all set up. The Kindle's out. The paperback is out. It's no quarter. The ravings of William Norman Grigg. And it's so good. <laughs> it's so good, man. I'm telling you, you know, I had to read it two or three times, three or four times for the edit and all that. And it's just devastating, too. I mean, it's just... And and the consistency of the quality of his writing. And, of course, uh, his nose for caring about all the same stuff as us and everything is just... And it's just great on war, on peace, and especially on the cops, man, and and so many things. Um, oh, yeah. I just know everybody's going to really love it. And I think anyone could guess this, uh, but also it's true that uh, all the money goes directly to Will Griggs' family. It doesn't even mm -hmm. stop at Go or anything like that. It's all connected directly to them. And so all the proceeds from the book... Um, and, and this is the kind of book that should sell for generations. I mean, it's a timeless, I mean, it's timely, but it's timeless too. You know what I mean? Kind of a thing. Uh, yeah, well, this is, this is really great news. I, uh, thanks to you saw what it looks like on Amazon. So the cover is, uh, unbelievably great. Yeah. Very great. fun. Great caricature. Everybody go at least take a look at it and then buy the book. Uh, I've read a lot of Will over the years. I haven't looked at this exact collection yet, so I'll be doing that. Uh, but uh, and also my thanks to you for uh, for making this happen. That's uh, that's just super great tribute to him, but also just a great service to to uh, all the readers out there, but potential readers because they need to if they don't already know Will through his writing, they uh, they, they need to meet him and enjoy uh, you know what he did because he just. He was unique and uh, irreplaceable, but at least we have this collection. We yeah. have all the writings he left behind. I'll tell you what, this is one of those, and this happens every time, but whenever a friend of mine dies, but this is this case especially, it just yeah. uh, it really bothers me, the whole incongruity thing between the value of a human life and how easy it is to lose one. You know, just it's so stupid. Some stupid heart yep. attack that happens for just... The space of five minutes is enough to cancel out the existence of a man as great as this. It just yeah. pisses me mm -hmm. off. Anyway, yeah. I do miss him. Um, we miss him. Yeah, and and people will when they read this too. It's just it's not fair that that he died at fifty two. It just totally sucks. But anyway, um, while he was alive, man, he was kicking ass. And you know, I was a fan of Will for a long time. I mean, I read him in the New American Magazine starting, I think, in like 95 or 96, right at the end of high school years. Mm. Um, and uh, so I was a huge fan of his for a very long time. And then we finally became friends by like 2003 or four, 
that's when I started interviewing him and uh, and talking with him. And uh, yeah, he's a great guy. Oh, I want to say about the book too. And I'm sorry because um, this should have got a note in the book. I don't know. He probably doesn't care. But I want to give credit to Grant Smith for um, for helping to format the the paperback version of this thing. Mike Dworsky also uh, who did such a great job of uh, putting together the EPUB and the dot Moby. That's the Kindle version of it. Uh, yeah. all, all the credit to him. And and it was Will who, himself who edited the book. And it was Will and Tom Edlam who, you know, originally formatted it and got all the everything. I mean, all I did here really was finally get off my butt and put the thing finally together. But um, it was everybody else's work. I didn't really do anything. I had a little publisher's note at the end just to say I missed the guy uh, kind of a thing. But other than that, yeah. all the credit goes to, of course, Will, Tom Edlam, Scott Alberts, Mike Dworsky, and Grant Smith for putting the thing well, together. Well, let me add my, my appreciation to the, that, uh, that group you just named. Yeah, uh, great, great guys. They, they've done uh, yeoman service, and uh, lots of people will, will be benefiting by, by being, having this book so you know, easily available and uh, for years to come. So my thanks to everybody who had any hand in it. Yeah, man. Um, so get out there, everybody. You'll see the banner ads up. We're, we're getting them together. So they'll be at the Institute and at scotthorton.org and hopefully I'm sure at antiwar.com. And, and also, you know what call goes out right now to, to all libertarian podcasters, please interview me and, or especially Tom Edlam, who was really Will's protege at the new American magazine there for many years and who wrote the introduction that Tom wrote is just a perfect biography of Will. It's you couldn't ask for better than what Tom did there. And I'm interviewing him later today about it too, but, um, please, I beseech all libertarian media people write about this thing, interview Tom Edlam, especially about this book, um, and, and help promote it. It's, you know, never even mind the fact that he left behind six kids and a sick wife, yes. unfortunately. Yes. Um, but, I mean, even without that, the thing is worth its weight in platinum. Forget it. It's it's stellar. It's the best stuff the libertarian movement produced so far in the 21st century or equal to it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like Ron Paul's first run in 08 <laughs> on paper, that level of quality of greatness. Anyway. Um, hey, here's another thing. Speaking of Ron, I'm interviewing him today again, and um, that'll be uh, interview 38 of Ron. I'll have to get that transcribed and added to the book I'm about to put out here in just another couple of weeks, I hope. Yeah. If this I say a really couple cool. of weeks, that probably means more like five or something, but I'm, I'm really trying to mm -hmm. buckle down now that Wills is out, and I'm putting out a book, The Great Ron Paul. The Scott Horton Show interviews 2004 through 2019. And it's just great. And when I go through editing it, I'm so proud of it and of him and of, I guess, myself, you know, pat on the back for just letting this man come on my show and say things 37 times over these years because he's just so brilliant and, and so perfectly morally libertarianly consistent on everything and just expert on every subject and it's just it's not like reading the same interview over and over and over again other than my oh, praise for sure. the guy i guess um which is a little embarrassing but i don't care um and uh but it's it's just awesome and that's coming out real soon. And and part of that is because the IRS is trying to kill me because, of course, I've worked for antiwar.com for, you know, the last 15 years, making $1,000 a month. So somebody's got to pay. Um, so I'm, this is my version of the Willie Nelson IRS tapes here, this Ron Paul book. I hope I'm not even going to get the money. I'm just going to use it to pay off the federal pigs so they don't, you know, continue oh. extorting me and coming to my, there's, there's my a, dad's there's some, house banging there's on the door. Huh? There's some irony there. Yeah. Well, I figure, you know what? Here's the guy who introduced the constitutional amendment to repeal the 16th every year. <laughs> the Liberty Amendment and to get rid of the central bank. Um, I figure I'll go ahead and use that for my IRS tapes and exploit that irony a little bit and try to put that behind me. And then I'm putting out a book. I know I'm just talking all over your interview today, but then I'm putting out a book of your essays about Palestine, like all of them, going back for 30 years or something like that, 1980s, 90s, 
and yeah. especially your Literally. recent series that you did last year for the Libertarian Institute, Why Palestine Matters. And it's such great stuff. Um, I just put it down for a minute when I was trying to rip those PDF files of just the last few there. I'm going to have to get back to it. But it's already almost ready already, so that ought to be able to come out pretty soon. And then, of course, I'm getting back to work on my book about the terror war. It's hard running an institute and doing all these things at the same time. But Yeah, plus you're doing interviews every day. But no, think of the stream of stuff that's coming. I'm saying this to the, the listeners now, not you. Uh, just think about the stream of uh, material beginning now with uh, with uh, Will's uh, collection that 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 is on the way, not not in the far distant future. So this is going to be very exciting stuff coming out from the Libertarian Institute. And uh, yeah. you're the man. You're, you're kind of the mover and the shaker here. You're making it happen. Well, you know, we're really suffering for the lack of Will Grigg here. I mean, the three of us together as a team was really the perfect kind of a thing there. And you know, compared to all the other libertarian institutes out there, I don't know how much of an institute we are, but we do have some great podcasters and some great regular writers. And then now, you know, with this book series putting out here, yep. starting with Fool's Aaron and the rest, that gives us a little bit of uh, oh, yeah. uh, something to claim. Street you know? cred. Um, Street cred. Yeah, man. And so oh, speaking of interviews, too, like this one, and you just mentioned uh, interviews all day. Well, uh, all day today... I'm doing 11 interviews, including this one, and the last one will be Gareth Porter, number 5,000. That's that's unbelievable, and uh, that's co that's an occasion for breaking out the champagne, I think. Yeah, I need to start 5, drinking. 000. Maybe I'll get and, some. And, and uh, think of that, 4,000 are with Gareth Porter, so that means 1,000 for the rest of us. Yeah, there you go. Just kidding. Um, uh, Gareth has Actually, you know you what? It's know, you probably know the number. How many is Gareth? It is. Have? I checked. It's because because he's last today. It's right now. It's at three hundred and sixteen Gareth Porter interviews. So today will be three hundred and seventeen. Not quite. He's not quite ten percent. Not quite. <laughs> but that's pretty good. <laughs> that's pretty darn good. And I, all that represents is that I've interviewed him about everything he's written since January two thousand seven. Because why wouldn't I? And he's such a he's such a article producing machine. Uh, unbelievable that uh, he's he's giving you you know every week he gives you many occasions to interview him so it, actually it's not that surprising when you think about it I'm delighted that he is eager to be on your show and so therefore has done so many yeah because he's a busy he's a busy guy but he also realizes talking about those articles with you uh, just is a magnifier a megaphone for the uh, for the articles so mm -hmm. uh, good for him good for you. Yeah, you know, I think it was Tatiana uh, Mraz asked me, so what's the big deal with Gareth then? Why is he so special or something? I said, well, you know what? If I was Mr. White, then he's Clark Kent. <laughs> like, he's just the best, man. He was, you know, yeah. if if I had the money and I could run my own Daily Planet, he's my star reporter, man. Simple as that. Gareth, go prove that what they said about Iran today isn't true. And then out he goes, the and then part. just a little while later, he shows why you should not believe what they're claiming today. Right. So, He's in a class by himself. Uh, that book he did on Iran, The Manufactured Crisis, is uh, people need to read that. It's as timely today as it was the day it came out. And, of course, you're right. He's keeping up with every one of these uh, uh, phony stories about uh, Iran, uh, given that uh, war, with, war with Iran is certainly possible. I'm not sure I'm ready to say likely, but, you know, you can't tell day to day. Uh, and you, we need Gareth in there debunking all these claims that, the, uh, you know, for decades they've said Iran is, you know, the, the biggest, uh, biggest uh, state sponsor of terrorism. And then... Uh, you know, but they never name anything. Uh, once in a while, they do name something, but you can count, you can look it up uh, to see what Gareth has had to say about it. And uh, you know, usually he he will show you that uh, we're, you know, he's addressed probably all of the all the charges, but he'll show you that there's nothing to the claims that the, the, there's either false flag or something phony going on. Uh, but the, the demonization of Iran since 1979 uh, it has been uh, you know intolerable. And, uh, and thank goodness for Gareth. Oh, yeah. Well, what about that time they attacked the USS Liberty? Oh, wait, that was Israel. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's funny. Uh, I guess I'd never heard anybody claim that it actually was Iran. Somewhere, so, somewhere somebody is claiming that. I just never heard it. 
Yeah. So you can't even just make fun me of now it. joking. You know what? It's pretty close though. Was when Ladine had influenced Michael Flynn to the degree when he was the head of the DIA that he was yeah. saying, you know, trying to get the DIA to prove somehow that Iran had done Benghazi. <laughs> it's like, no, man, those right. are your Al Qaeda guys. Goofball. Well, and that book, Flynn and what didn't Flynn and uh, and Ladine do a book together where they yeah. they had they had their own axes of evil, which included Al Qaeda, Iran. Uh, Maduro, and, uh, Libya, and Kim, and yeah. everybody. So there was, they, they, they couldn't even keep the line straight, making an, uh, Iran an ally of uh, bin Laden. Hang on just one second. Hey, man, here's a book you guys got to read. It's called No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Barakchani. No Dev, No Ops, No IT. It's a book about how a libertarian ought to run his tech company. I think you'll really get a kick out of it. No dev, no ops, no IT. All right, so listen, man, let me ask you a thing here. We got about 10 minutes to talk about this, so I was kind of thinking I would ask you all about libertarianism, but on the other hand, <laughs> we don't really have that much time. Um, but I, I, So uh, let's talk about one extremely important aspect of libertarianism, anti-imperialism. And I don't know if you what? saw this, but the Libertarian Party chair put out a, this video by, I guess, the treasurer of the Hawaii Libertarian Party chapter, something like that. Anyway, yeah. you know, coming out full throated for regime change to put Guaido in power in Venezuela because yeah. libertarianism means opposition to socialism. <laughs> and so all us libertarians stand by this coup, he announced. And... And it was the chair of the party that put that thing out and said, hey, everybody, check out this great thing. And so, you know, I, I was I wondering know if maybe this. you could explain a little bit about, like, maybe if there's anything more important than opposing socialism in other people's countries to the libertarian ideology or movement or future. Well, I was unaware of the, yeah, the story you just related. I didn't know. I don't, I don't see that. I, I get press releases from the Libertarian Party. And maybe it was in that, but I, I don't pay close enough attention to them. I usually don't open them, so maybe that's my fault. But, uh, well, I, mean, I don't know the kind of case this person in Hawaii made, but the idea that you can go from, op, quote, opposition to socialism to favoring U.S. efforts to change the regime in Venezuela, you know, there's like several hundred thousand light years between those two statements, you can oppose socialism all you want, but it nowhere follows that therefore the U.S. military or you know even diplomats, to think of uh, Ukraine for a moment, should be engaged in regime change. I mean, one doesn't follow from the other, because a whole lot of other things come into play if you favor regime change, like the U.S. government having a, a, a military that's uh, prepared to engage in regime change and uh, and all the things that go along with that, which is, you know, take us way more than 10 minutes to discuss all the implications of a uh, of an imperial state or national security state, whatever name we want to attach to it. Um, so go ahead, oppose uh, state socialism all you want. But what's that got to do with uh, the U.S. government being involved in regime change? You can't have... You know, I don't want any government, but you can't even have a very small, uh, limited government if you're going to be in, uh, pursuing imperial policies all over the world. Even if you're, even if you think you're a good faith world policeman, which doesn't happen anyway. We know it's not good faith uh, policing that goes on. It's uh, political stuff, geopolitical ambitions, and military industrial complex interests that uh, end up controlling. But even if you imagine for the moment uh, some utopia where there's there's good faith world policing, you can't have a small government and low taxes without that. I mean, with with that policy, with, with world policing. Because, uh, the, hey, the world's, uh, uh, in a way, a disorderly place in, in a lot of ways. And, uh, and um, if you're going to give that uh, mission to the government, uh, it's going to be pretty busy, which means it's going to be consuming resources, distorting the economy. And again, this just assumes unrealistically good faith. Add to the fact that you're not going to get good faith. You're going to get operators 
who are uh, uh, you know self-serving and interested in mission creep and interested in justifying everything as a threat to us, even when there's no not even the remotest threat. And that's a recipe for uh, a humongous government that's gobbling up uh, uh, tons of resources, diverting uh, labor and and, uh, in, and entrepreneurial ingenuity away from serving consumers and into serving you know the the, the government's missions. And how does that in any way uh, line up with uh, libertarian sensibilities? It doesn't at all. And, you know, I I get it that libertarians, a lot of times, they come from the right. And I hate this because this caricature is, I think, not really representative of the libertarian movement overall at all. I, I think it's a mischaracterization, but there is a certain truth to it that libertarians essentially are Republicans who are for bro jobs and pot smoking. And so that makes them different than Republicans a little bit. But essentially, they are still relying on all of the same garbage that they were taught in government school when they were a kid about the benevolence of, of uh, you know, the government's intentions and the the transitive property of democracy where you believe something and then the government makes it happen for you. And just all this garbage, the way that people are raised, uh, especially conservatives in this country. And then so they just I guess they're just kind of helpless. Right. They're they're lost in the dark. They can't even sit here and say to themselves, well, geez, I was just reading in the paper this morning that America bombed a bunch of their own puppet Afghan soldiers and cops twice in a week yeah. like 30 of them oops dropped the J dam on the wrong group of cops and this is a war that's been going on for a generation now oh you know what we should do we should go to venezuela and help the people there after right. all this after iraq after the islamic state and libya and yemen and afghanistan now you're going to go help the people of what Honduras again too? You gonna help another coup in Honduras? I mean, and and never even mind the history of all of American oppression in Latin America. You right. know they've they've actually been on the back burner this century so far as USA has been busy, busy killing Arabs. But yeah. how how the Libertarian Party could sit uh, here and act like history just began yesterday? And there's this poor Stalinist country a couple miles of here that could really use a helping hand without taking into account the context of any other thing. American corporate power, oil interests, John Bolton, the CIA, any other thing, any of the consequences for the people of the Middle East or of Latin America this whole time is just absolutely incredible. You know what well, I mean? We, like we, this guy uh, gets everything he knows from CNN, the leader of the LP, or what? No, it's appalling. And uh, to gauge in a little bit of hyperbole, none of us should sleep until we uh, demolish the impression that li libertarians and conservatives are, are, are relatives or in the same family. We have to destroy that idea uh, because that has been so damaging. It, that was a historical sort of accident because of, uh, you know, the the, uh, the Soviet Union after uh, the Cold War, after World War II, uh, and that uh, too many libertarians, there were heroic libertarians who fought this, but the, too many libertarians thought, oh, no, the conservatives are our natural allies, and, uh, you know, they'll be, because uh, the, they're for free markets, we're for free markets, they're for limited government, we're for limited government, of course, I'm not, I'm not for... I'm for limiting government, but I'm not for limited government. Uh, and uh, and then even some of them would say, well, look, even once the Soviet Union goes away, they'll be with us on foreign policy. Even the ones that were tuned into foreign policy correctly would sometimes make apologies for the conservatives and say, but once the Cold War is over, uh, they'll, they'll be with us even on foreign policy. Well, none of that is true. We can see the Cold War has been over a good, a good, a good long time, and uh, awful, an awful lot of conservatives, there are, there are honorable exceptions, like the American conservative, but an awful lot of conservatives are uh, as warmongering as, as they were when the uh, Soviet Union existed. They're not with us on the free market, as we could see. I mean, you just need to go back to George W. Bush and the, 
when the uh, recession hit and he said we need to violate free market principles, what, to save the free market. Um, and now with Trump, it's all over with, you know, again, with a couple of, well, I was going to say a couple of honorable exceptions, but maybe those, the people I'm now thinking of are, are really libertarians and not conservatives at all. But uh, I mean, look at them with Trump. Now they embrace protectionism. They embrace, uh, uh, I mean, they, they've, they've talked some peace, but somehow we haven't actually seen it in action yet. So uh, they're not allies at ours. They're not family members. Uh, if there's a family, a libertarian family, if there's a conservative family reunion, uh, I, don't send me an invitation because I'm not in your family. And if I put on a libertarian reunion, don't expect an invitation because you know, I don't believe you're in, our, in my family. Historically, uh, liberalism and libertarianism uh, have been on the left and have been anti-empire, <clears throat> anti-military with, you know, no thank you for your service. You know, I like to say thank you for your service to the empire. If I'm going to thank for service, that's that's how I'm going to complete the sentence. There's no family resemblance or relationship. So let's stop acting like it is. And I can't stand it. I hear it almost all the time of uh, people say, you know, conservative slash libertarians as if as if they're uh, yeah, they're Republicans who, you know, who think marijuana should be legal. The, the, if you think that's the difference between those two camps, uh, you got to go back and do some reading. Yeah. Well, and there sure are a hell of a lot of difference differences between us and the left, too, which is. I think, as you say, that's the historical accident where, wow, the leftists in adopting Marxism became even more statist than the conservatives, who always were the party of the crown and the church and the and I mean the church with political power, not just religion in general. But I mean, the old mm -hmm. order of, you know, feudal power. Um, and so. Uh, that does make us seem like friends of the conservatives compared to, you know, people who want to nationalize everything, <laughs> you know, and abolish prices and human nature. That's not going to work. Um, but, yeah, you're right. That shouldn't make us move right. That should just show conservatives why to stop being conservatives and to become libertarians, really. So, Right. But, 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 there, but there's always been a, a libertarian element. That identified with the left. Uh, Bastiat, when he was in the, the, the Fran France's national legislature in the early uh, first half of the uh, 19th century, sat on the left. That's where that term actually comes from. You had the opponents of the old regime on the left and the, the apologists for the old regime on the right. And uh, Bastiat sat with Proudhon. They disagreed on a lot of things about whether uh, uh, if you abolish government, uh, if the government stops intervening in the economy, will there be rent, will there be interest? I mean, they, they debated economics, but they, they agreed that the government shouldn't be meddling with uh, interfering with people's peaceful economic, and not just economic activity. There are no strictly economic activities with yeah. people's activity, peaceful activities. Um, and then if you go to the American, the early American libertarians, I'm talking now uh, late 19th century, 20th century, Benjamin Tucker, people are around Liberty Magazine. They identified with the left. I mean, they were part of the Socialist International. Now, they, were, they, they had uh, argument, big arguments with them, and, uh, and, tu and Tucker uh, sort of got fed up uh, eventually. But, but um, they saw themselves as leftists. They were pro-worker. They were, they were part of the workers' movement, uh, trying to fr free it from, uh, from government and, and bosses who were linked to government. And, you know, just uh, they had all the same concerns that many libertarians have today. Mm -hmm. And it was not right wing. It was not pro-military. Hey, uh, uh, what's a good not, article by you about that stuff? Uh, gosh, I don't know if I've actually done an article about uh, Tucker and those people, but uh, others have. I don't have anything off the top of my head. Uh, 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 Look up Roder – people can Google Roderick Long mm -hmm. and put in Benjamin Tucker and, and you'll find stuff. And I think – I think uh, – uh, who is it? David D'Amato has written about Benjamin Tucker at libertarianism.org at the, uh, one of the Cato Institute uh, sites. So uh, overall, I mean uh, in that broader take, I always of course have my old standby. It's one of if not my favorite Rothbard essay from 1965, Left and Right, The Prospects for Liberty. And yeah. people know of Rothbard as a crotchety old right winger by the 1990s. But in this case, he's saying that libertarianism is all the way to the left, to the left of the Reds um, and what statists the right are from that angle. And it's a great one. There's so much, you know, these are all kind of metaphysical concepts and all that, but there's so much truth. And I've had so many people tell me that their mind has been blown by reading that article that 
just help makes them have to right. recategorize all kinds and of things. And they can they should also they can Google for a Roderick Long article uh, about it was actually a speech he gave uh, about that Rothbard essay. So if you oh, put okay. in Roderick Long and Rothbard and prospects, uh, you know, the prospects for liberty or left and right prospects That's for liberty. That that commentary by Roderick will come up, and and that will be full, filled with interesting stuff on this topic. Cool. All right. Well, I got to let you go because next up is Peter Ford on Al Qaeda in Syria. Okay. Well, have a great day and congratulations on five thousand interviews. Fantastic. Scott. Cool. Thanks very much, Sheldon. Talk to you soon. Appreciate me. All right, you guys. That's the great Sheldon Richmond. Uh, and. And, you know, for people not too familiar, don't think, uh, well, anyway, let me tell you, he wrote the book on homeschool, on guns, and on abolishing the income tax. That's what kind of leftist libertarian he is. Get your head around that stuff. Libertarianinstitute.org. Oh, yeah, and his latest was why we should repeal the Constitution and go back to the Articles of Confederation. <laughs> well, well, that's even too status, but... Uh... Yeah, I know. I didn't mean to make you out like a collectivist there, but... <laughs> on the way right. to anarcho nothingness all right appreciate it bud bye-bye so you like supporting anti-war radio hosts that makes sense uh here's how you can do that go to scotthorton.org slash donate and there's all kinds of options to do so and all kinds of different kickbacks at different levels of course take uh, paypal patreon and all different kinds of digital currencies and all of those sorts of things and anybody who signs up by way of Patreon or PayPal to donate $5 a month to the show will automatically get keys to the Reddit room, my own private Reddit group that I have. Quite a few members now and lots of fun in there every day. So uh, check out all about that at scotthorton.org donate. And thanks.